Good afternoon, everybody. We're so excited that you're joining us today for today's event with Kay Wilson. But before we get started, I wanted to introduce myself briefly and how our event will work and then introduce our camera fellow, Austin, from Carleton University who helped plan today's event. Uh, my name is David, I'm with Camera on Campus and we're so excited to host this event and have this conversation. We are in webinar format which means that you'll be able to participate in our event by submitting questions in the Q&A function on Zoom and on our comment section on Facebook Live. Please make sure to submit your questions throughout the event, um, even during before Q&A starts, and we'll make sure that your questions get added to our queue and that they get answered um, during the event. Without further ado, however, um, I'll introduce Austin, Austin is a senior at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada, and he is studying European and Russian studies and political science. He has a deep passion for Israeli politics, history, and advocacy. Thanks so much, Austin. We're very excited, and uh, without further ado. Perfect. Thank you so much, David. Hello, everybody, and uh, good afternoon. Thank you for taking the time today to uh, join us on our webinar with our very special guest, Kay Wilson. Um, so before we kick off, just a little bit of an introduction to who Kay is. So Kay Wilson, a British-born Israeli, is a tour guide, musician, and an author of the prize-winning memoir, The Rage Less Traveled, in which, she in which she details surviving a Palestinian machete attack and her uh, subsequent lifelong road to recovery. She addresses a variety of audiences all over the world and has delivered a speech to the United Nations. In her role as representative of Palestinian Media Watch, she lobbies Western governments to end the foreign aid that awards her, her would-be murderers. Together with a Palestinian friend, she created an after-school club for children in a Palestinian refugee camp who, led, who, who learned apathy, courage, and to cherish their lives. Kay, whose actions led to the capture of her assailants, has been recognized by the Israeli police and the Israeli security agency for her courage. The machete attack was the subject of an acclaimed Israeli documentary, Black Forest, broadcasted in 2018. With, uh, for, with further ado, I'll turn it over to Kay. And we're on campus, good evening. Uh, I'm actually very honored to be speaking for one of my favorite organizations who do such great work. So I'm just sorry I can't see you all, but um, what you're going to see, you're going to see uh, 20 minutes of this Israeli acclaimed documentary, which uh, actually it was one movie in a series of three, and it was about DNA. Uh, so it's a documentary, as I said, and I need to tell you what happened before, because we're going to start it in the middle of the movie. Um, February 2010. Uh, an Israeli woman is found murdered near Beit Shemesh, okay, just south of Jerusalem. And she was murdered in the winter, the rain comes, it washes away all the DNA evidence. Her name is Netta Blatsorek. And so the police were unable to gather enough forensic evidence to uh, catch her uh, assailants. And for the next few months, they tried to swab different people living in the area. They did an extensive investigation to people who had previous convictions. And it came about they're looking for a particular uh, man called Kifach Ginimat. Okay, so we've got a murdered Netta Blatsorek. In the movie, you're going to see uh, Netta's husband, Amots, and Netta's mother, Dina. That's all you need to worry about, and you're going to see me. Now, the reason why we're going to screen this uh, movie is I've been, I've met some of you before, I think. Uh, but uh, I've been speaking for the last seven years, and contrary to popular opinion, it's actually becoming much harder for me to detail the machete attack. And so this is to say, this is, I went back with a film crew, and it is a very, very uh, realistic rendition of what happened. So I'll hand it back to Cameron Campus. And uh, what can I say? Pleasant viewing. It's a bit bad taste, really, but <laughs> I'll see you after the movie. 
Perfect. Thank you so much, Kay. Um, right now I'll share my screen and we'll view the documentary. ‫המקרה של קיי תופס אותי ‫במשמרת במד"א בגוש עציון, ‫אנחנו מקבלים קריאה. על מישהי שנמצאה דקורה, עלתה מאיזה ואדי, יחפה, לא ברור מה קורה שם. אנחנו מגיעים, רואים גברת פצועה עם הרבה דקירות בגוף. מתחילים טיפול, מציל חיים, ותוך כדי זה היא אומרת לנו שיש עוד, עוד חברה שלה שנמצאת בוואדי והיא לא יודעת מה קורה איתה, ואנחנו מזיקים עוד כוחות. באינטואיציה שלנו אנחנו תמיד חושבים מה יכול להיות קשור למה, בטח באירוע הזה שהסמיכות היא... יחסית קרובה, שהתא השטח הוא יחסית קרוב, קו אווירי המרחק הוא לא גדול מדי. אני מגיעה לבית החולים כי היא נמצאת במצב מאוד מאוד לא טוב. הייתה חבושה כולה, בקושי דיברה, הייתה חלשה מאוד. אנחנו יושבות, והיא מתחילה לספר לי את הסיפור הכל כך קשה ו... וטראומטי. בהתחלה באופן מאוד מאוד כללי, מה קרה, ואחר כך אנחנו יורדות לפרטים. עד היום שאני נזכרת במה שקיי עברה, ואני ככה מנסה להיכנס לתחושות שלה ומה עבר עליה באותו רגע, זה לא נתפס בעיניי. So I signal Christine not to make a noise because I, I didn't want them to see us. But one stands up and he says, Yes, you have mine? Like in English. At that time, Kay understands that something is not good to happen. I was still feeling very nervous as so I took out my little pen knife. Walking, walking down the hill through the thicket. She's behind me. She screams. And as I turn around, it's like, it's, it's like a log, you know, a tree gets in my back. And I go to the, fall to the ground. My nose splits open. And someone's rubbing my head in the dirt. I'm going to go to the world. 
והיא דוקרת במפסעה את אחד החשודים. כל זה היא מספרת לי בבית החולים בקושי רב, שהיא באמת פצועה אנוש, ואני בכלל לא בטוחה שהיא הולכת לסיים את זה. זאת אומרת, אני לא בטוחה שאני מצליחה לגבות ממנה את כל הפרטים האלה, ושהיא תשרוד בכלל עד הסוף. a universe, a universe of Chetzi Shah, you know, where we're standing, standing under the trees. I can smell the pines, I can hear the birds, and uh, we're being held at knife point. In the first few minutes, you know, it's like I've been banged on the head. You know, I can't think. All I can think of It doesn't happen to me. This is, this is a dream. And then he sees my Magen David, and he just took it off very gently. You know, it wasn't... And he, he smiles, and he says, Shuhai, dear, like, what's this? So I answered in, uh, in Hebrew, I said to Magen David, I see this light out of the corner of my eye. And it's not God, and it's not my life flashing before me. You know, it's the sun on his machete. And I realize he's going to behead me. And just as I think of that, and everything I remember about the people is very musical, the sounds I remember even more than the sights. It's like some cosmic symphonia, you know, they scream, Allah Akbar. I hear Christine say, Jesus, help me. And uh, he stabs me in the back so hard, I fall to the ground. I don't know, I just realized then somehow that the only, that people die with their eyes open and I must play dead. So I made a moral choice and I tried not to move and I kept my eyes open and I watched like two meters away, no more than, no more than two meters. Christine was on her back. And he's like hacking her up. Okay, the Christine is so hot, shuba shuba, zuba gaba, zuba gaba. And the case is that you can't lose it, Christine, you can't lose it. So after 12 beatings, they, uh, they leave. I'm still on my side. And then the ground, there's a vibration, you know? And I realize they're coming back. And one rolls me over now on my back. So I'm looking up at the pine trees. And the sun is low and it's pink. And it's orange and it's purple. It's the most beautiful sunset. And then suddenly, This, hand, this silhouette of a hand and a knife, it covers the sun. And behind that silhouette, I see these black eyes. And I watch him. I watch him stab me in the chest. And I don't blink, flinch, move. I don't know how that happened. That one missed my heart by Arba Milometer. Okay, so they think I'm dead and they leave. And I have one last commission in life and that's to die. My last thing in life that I want to do now is die nearer where I parked the car so the police can find my body. Step by step, I begin to walk, and it's uh, extremely hard, you know. 
היא עוזבת את המקום כשהיא תקורה 13 פעמים בכל אה, אה, חלק אפשרי, כי בלי נעליים היא חצי קשורה. My lungs are filling with blood. It's like breathing through a straw, you know? No, not enough air. And I see my dog beside me, you know, she's bleeding and... Yeah, yeah, it was just everything was closing down. Starting to think of a doodle somewhere over the rainbow and I'm thinking of these chords. And everything is collapsing. I'm, f I'm, I'm feeling so cold, like cold. I never, even the colors around are going strange, you know? They're, it's not autumn color, it's going gray and blue and white. It's, it's like I'm in a fridge, the cold. ואז ככה היא שומעת אה, משפחה שברקע, היא שומעת ילדים, והיא עוד תוך כדי זה, עם כל מה שהיא עברה, היא חושבת רק שלא יראו את הילדים. שבת חורפית יפה של דצמבר, תופסים איזושהי פינה ל- לעשות פיקניק עם, ה- עם הילדים, ו... קטע שהוא טיפה מוגבה מעלינו בתוך, בתוך החניון, מישהי נכנסת בהליכה אה, מאוד מוזרה, ברור שמשהו פה מוזר, פתאום קולטים שהיא בעצם, שהידיים אה, קשורות מאחורי הגב, שכל הבגדים שלה אה, מגואלים בדם, גם קשור לה לפה איזשהו צעיף, אנחנו שומעים בערך ככה מבעד לפה הקשור שלה, אה, אה, משהו כמו פיגוע, פיגוע, היה פה פיגוע, רצחו את חברה שלי. You feel guilty. Of course you feel guilty. Listen, peanuts, as Drew knows, my dog got run over, okay? And for me, there's more guilt there because when my dog, when my dog got run over, it was the first time I cried. It was like my world collapsed because the death of Christine was too big. It's just too big. It's, you can understand a car מהעדכונים שאני מקבל בזירה, מהבחינה של זהות הקורבנות, הדינמיקה הקבוצתית בין הרוצחים, הקשירות של אותן נשים, העובדה שמדובר בשניים, בחירת האזור וסוג הכלי של הרצח, עולה בי החשד שאכן יכול להיות שמדובר באנשים שביצעו את הרצח של נטע סורק, ואני יודע שאני צריך לבדוק את הנושא הזה. עושים DNA, צריך לנסות להבין איפה התוקף הנוגע. אי אפשר לדגום את הזירה, לא לוקחים את כל הבית, לא לוקחים את כל המכונית, לא לוקחים את כל הכביש, לא לוקחים את כל היער, כי אני לא יכול לראות DNA בעיניים, אין לי שום דרך לאתר אותו. אז אני צריך להיכנס לראש של המבצע, ולנסות להבין איך הוא, איך הוא עשה את זה, במה הוא נגע בזמן ביצוע העבירה. אני פשוט זוכרת הכל בתיק הזה, יש דברים שאני לא יודעת יש תיקים שאתה בכלל לא זוכר שעשית, שהם נורא נורא מפורסמים וידועים, אבל אתה בכלל לא זוכר שהיית שם בפנים. ויש תיקים שמלווים אותך. לא יודעת למה, זה תיק שמלווה אותי. במקרה הזה, ארנון סיפר פרט מאוד מאוד חשוב, שבגלל הפרט הזה, הגילוי היה נורא מהיר. והפרט הזה קשור לקיי... ווילסון זאתי שבעצם נפצעה והיא צריכה לברוח. 
ברגע שהיא אמרה שהיא השתמשה בצד ימין עם הסכין כדי לנסות לפגוע בו, פשוט הלכתי כמו שהיא אמרה, זה ממש, ממש הלכתי לשרוול מצד ימין, ואני זוכרת אפילו את, ה, את הגודל של הכתמי דם שהיו, ממש ראיתי כתמי דם על השרוול, ואז אמרתי, אני אדגום מכמה אזורים בשרוול, דגמתי, והתחלתי את התהליך של, ה, של הפקת פרופיל ל-DNA. כי הסיכוי למצוא DNA שלו בתוך... סוואצ'ר מגואל בדם של הקורבן, זה כמו למצוא מחט בערימת שחת. והשלב הבא שקיווינו זה שאם הוא יהיה במאגר או לא יהיה במאגר. ובאמת, בסופו של דבר יצא פרופיל DNA זכרי. איך שיצא פרופיל DNA זכרי, הכנסתי אותו למחשב, וממש זה עניין של שניות. וכל מה שהתפללתי זה רק שוהה במאגר, רק שוהה במאגר. אחרי החיפוש, פשוט היה בינגו. הראשון להיעצר הוא הראשון שהיו לנו, שזוהו ממצאים פורנזיים שלא יד חטפת. בהתחלה הוא לא, לא סיפר בהתחלה. התחיל לדבר, להרחיק את עצמו, אחרי זה הקריב את עצמו למקום. עד לאט לאט שהתחברתי אליו, התחלנו לדבר. מתחיל לספר בדיוק מה הוא עשה. התודעה הראשונה מתחילה כאילו להגיע, ואז היא מתחילה להתגלגל, אתה אומר, וואלה, הנה, מה שאמרה כן זה נכון. הוא מסביר את הדברים, הוא אומר את הדברים. כשאני מתחיל לחקור אותו, הוא מתחיל לספר כל מיני סיפורים, ואז הוא אומר, אני הייתי עם עוד אנשים. כשעלה השם של כיפה חנימת, הבנו שיש לנו יכולת לסגור מעגל גם בנושא של הרצח הקודם. אני הלאה, אנחנו נתלה על מחל לי שרפי אלחדס. طيب انت جاهز تطلع معنا لهناك وتفرجينا كل اللي عملته هناك انت واصحابك فشو تم كيرو اتا يار ذا كيرو تو كل بينا يدعو كل دبر ما ايش بو ما ايش بو ما ايش ما ايفو ما يو اكلين ايفو ما يو جوين شيتو ملو ما ايتا اوخل بو ما هو ملي يوني ما لو يونا انا ما شو زاز ايتي شوخد واخلين من ذا موسيقى <تصفيق> أنا لما نفتت جيت من هون جيت من هون على إياد قلت له يلا قلت له في ناس يلا بنروح قال لي أنت خلص على واحدة وأنا على واحدة قلت له طيب هو كان مسكر إيديهن ومسكر عينيه في إيش مسكر إيديهن وإيديهن؟ بخيط انسحبت للسكينة وفي كانت قاعدة ضربتها بهذا الشكل مرتين ضربت عليهم هو ضرب اللي بقت هون وصلنا أبو الأحمر أنا وصلت عند أبو الأحمر هو كان واقف هون في النتفة هاي ترجع عاود ضرب اللي كانت هانا الضعيفة هاي شنطة ليش هي أدرى من شنطة هون؟ رمى هون قلنا بدنا يوم انت ما كان في معك شنطة؟ هاي أنا بقى معي شنطة هاي يوم شوف يوم كمان تحت الحجر أنا شايف هون فيها شيء تاني كمان ترجع أرجع لورا أرجع זה הכי קשה, זה השחזור. כשאת רואה את זה, את אומרת, מה הולך כאן? אין רגשות, אין. עכשיו עשרה לארבע אחרי הצהריים, אנחנו הגענו פה, בהובלתו של העצור, אנחנו ממשיכים את החיפוש לאחר המוצגים. חיפושים אה, בהובלתו של החשוד, הגענו למוצגים, גם לכלי הרצח, אני כרגע עם היחד עם החשוד, אנחנו מצביעים על כלי הרצח אחד אחד. היי hey, סכיני, למין היא כאן, מאמין היא סכיני? היי כאן, מאי. כאן, מאי? וסכיני, תני, מאמין כאן? מאי יוד. 
مائية العلبة السوداء السمراء هاي بأي سكينة كانت السكينة تبعتك صحيح اوكي إسا قولي بس مات شوي السكينة تاريخ يوم هو 28 لـ 2010 كفاح انت بتعرف احنا بأي منطقة منطقة موجودين؟ أي منطقة؟ منطقة الدير منطقة الدير دير الإيش؟ دير الجمال دير الجمال سكينة معي تحت ال تحت ال البلوزة يعني ظليت ماشي وهو هيك عاج إبراهيم ماسك معي وخذنا وطلعنا من هاي الناحية يلا أوكي أنا كنت ماسك هيك وإبراهيم كان ماسك من الناحية الثانية هي بالفترة هاي كانت إذا حكت إشي صوتات صحيح أوكي شو كان تاني شو اسمه إبراهيم كان شاد ثمة سكر ثم إبراهيم كان سكر ثم صحيح نقول إن هذا كان الخزر وين كان محطوط أنت معي تحت البلوزة أوكي أنا لما جيت كانت السكينة في جنبي شو كانت كانت في لبسة لابسة لابسة العد صحيح أوكي ضربت أنا مرة هيك وكمان مرة أوكي أوكي مين حط الخيط هيك؟ إبراهيم إبراهيم هو كان ماسك من الناحية هاي وأنا كنت ماسك من الناحية هاي ليش ليش جيتوا على المنطقة هاي؟ لأنه نقتل دكتور مين؟ يعود ليه؟ بس هذا جينا نكتر شو السبب؟ ما في سبب ما في سبب מבחינתי היה ברגע שפואד התקשר אליי והודיע לי על התפיסה של כיפח ועל ההודעה, זה היה מבחינתי איזושהי סגירת מעגל גם בנושא הזה. כן, בהחלט. השיחה הזאת, הטלפון הזה, אני חשבתי עליו עוד הרבה אחרי. אני שמחתי מאוד כמובן על התפיסה שלו, על המעצר שלו, כשזה היה גם מעול, גם בטיפה. באיזשהו עצב על זה שזה לא נעשה קצת יותר מדי, יותר מוקדם. When you see someone, when you experience goodness, Bani Zachiti Latuf Mikulkacha Bayanashim, that makes me weep, not evil. I wouldn't want to give them the privilegia that they are making me cry. All right, well, thank you, um, Kay, for sharing this documentary with us. Um, we'll move on to Kay talking a little bit more about her experience now. And yeah, we'll let Kay take it away once again. Hey, thank you, uh, camera. Um, I'll just tell you something just to lighten things up, all right? So I was speaking to a group of, 
I don't know, young people the other day, uh, and we screened this this uh, documentary, and one of them, one of them says, first of all, I have to backtrack, okay. So I went back to the forest with the police. It was me, it was me, I did, I did everything. There were no like extras, there was nobody being me, I did it. And in this group, one of the kids said, uh, that was you, you were in the forest, you did that? That must've been terrifying. So I said, it was more scary the first time round. All right, so everything's in proportion. Now, uh, I know this is being recorded as well. So I thought what I'd talk about briefly and shortly is um, not that it was a school, but certain things over the last few years, this was 10 years ago, um, which could be a long time, but sometimes it's not a long time. But I, I just wanna talk a bit about the things I've, uh, I'm honing in on myself. I don't wanna say learned, cause it's not, it's not a school. The forest wasn't a school. But I think the things that I've, I've thought about are applicable for every human being. Um, and I'm sure that I'm not the only person in this session or people who are watching it later. I'm sure I'm not the only one who's like uh, suffered a traumatic event or has been victimized. But I think it's human tendency to ask when something goes wrong. I wish you could all yell at me, you know, but when something goes wrong, uh, what's the first question we, we ask ourselves? If something terrible happens to us, the first question is, I can hear you all say it now, is why? Why me? And that was a question I had to also ask, like, why me? What, what did I do to deserve this? And uh, after much thinking and much therapy, I'm still in trauma therapy 10 years on, uh, I, I came to realize, you know, when there's like... Um, Let's say, let's put it in context, right? All these people are dying now in India in coro uh, of Corona and it's terrible. But I, I can honestly say with a hand on my heart, I never say, why them? I mean, it's terrible, but why them? Meaning uh, I realized I lived a very self-centered life. It's almost like a sense of entitlement that there's like how many millions, billions of people in the world? And so many people have terrible things happen to them. And I never ask why it happens to other people, but when it happens to me, I, it's really an audacious response really, why me? So I learned that I'm not really the center of the universe, uh, which was a huge lesson and it came very belated in my life. Um, and there's this uh, little Jewish maxim, uh, where this Jewish guy, he speaks to God and he's moaning about his problems. And he says, uh, God, master of the universe, why me? And a little voice from heaven answers, why not? So I think that's kind of uh, my theory. I know, I know that other people would differ. We all have our different, you know, we take different paths and stuff, but I'm not quite sure that there has, there has to be a reason for everything. Maybe there is, but I, I, got, I got very comfortable. Uh, I, I found a place where I could settle my brain, so to speak. And it was, it was okay. I didn't have to understand why it happened. Uh, now, another, another question that people say, and we know it as Jews throughout history, is the where, the where factor. Where was God? Where was, where was Hashem? And uh, I don't know. But I, I, I could say, I mean, it's like a, a metaphor. It's not actually real, but I could say like, you know what? God was in the forest, meaning I could smell him in the pines. I could hear him in the birds. You know, I could see him in that sunset. So I, don't, I also don't think that's an uh, appropriate question because if I'm going to accuse God for murder, then I have to indict him for that sunrise. If I'm going to blame him for savagery, then I, I have to hold him accountable for the birth of a baby. I mean, I can't have my cake and eat it too. So the question wasn't the why or the where was God, but uh, it was actually, I had to go back to the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish Bible. And uh, the first question there is in the very first book, 
And it really struck me. A rabbi friend of me said to me once, this is the question. When Adam and Eve screw up, you know, they eat the fruit or whatever it was. And God takes a little stroll in the yard and he says, Ayeka, meaning, where are you, Adam? Adam, humankind, people, where are you? And I really took that to heart, like, where, what have these people, these terrorists, you know, what have they become? And I said it in the movie, what have they become that they could, they could hold a machete in one hand and a marlboro in the other and hack at innocent women without blinking an eye? So I think this is a question we also need to ask ourselves, just as individuals, as we go through life, you know, it has to, you have to do some kind of soul searching. So that's been very, very important for me. Now, once I, I put the responsibility on the, like the existential responsibility as well on the terrorists, uh, Judaism says this, Judaism uh, says, when we know something is wrong or amiss, uh, we have to take responsibility to try and make it right. And there you have the actual essence of the word responsibility. It's our ability to uh, respond to something. So I, I've done two things. And that's by inquiring as to what is happening, that these two men could do what they do. And there's two, two factors that I found. One is um, the incitement in the Palestinian Authority. I mean, as I said in the movie, I have Palestinian friends and I've, I've been to the Palestinian areas. Their curriculums are saturated with anti-Semitism. They name their streets after martyrs. They have songs about killing Jews. There's incitement. It's an educational issue, uh, which is why I started this little after school club for Palestinian children to open their world that they wouldn't just be stuck with radical Islam and hopelessness. And the other thing, of course, uh, that I've been fighting over the last few years is not just the incitement, it's the incentive. And my would-be murderers, to date, have received well over $100,000 each. Uh, and I've spoken on behalf of Palestinian Media Watch, and I've tried to stop all this, uh, not with much success. Holland stopped it, Denmark. There's been some moving of the waves, but uh, it was very, uh, very enraging for me to realize, I mean, I have like a brother back in England in my former life, and uh, he's a working man. And through his taxes, it, he actually funds the people who tried to murder me. And that's, it's just, it's just beyond what I could even think about. But that's nevertheless the, 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 the road of responsibility I've taken. One is to try and help children have a better life so they can choose goodness over evil. And the other is to put a stop to the rewarding of cold-blooded murder. Now, the, the third thing, and this is the most heavy thing I had to ask myself, you know, uh, I mean, have somebody as a tour guide who's mixed with all communities here. Uh, and I do have to say this, I say it every time I speak and I forgot, it was an Arab Muslim surgeon who saved my life. Okay, that's very, very important to understand. But nevertheless, I'm left with this, and don't forget I'm traumatized, okay? Highly traumatized. Uh, and I'd, I thought, how on earth, you know, I, I want, I, how do you say, I won't pull the wool over your eyes. I hated them. I could have sliced them up. And I mean, I still hate them. There's nothing wrong with hating people who commit evil. But I, I wanted to know how could I not hate everybody who's a Palestinian or a Muslim or an Arab? Why am I suspicious of everybody? And uh, once again, although not, not particularly observant, but there's a lot of wisdom in Judaism. And there's a uh, very striking verse in the Talmud, which says, he who is kind to the cruel shall be cruel to the kind. And I think that's just brilliant Jewish wisdom. And it helped me because I understood, and I think it's true for anybody who's been victimized, 
And I mean victimized. I don't just mean somebody cutting you up in the traffic or something like that, all right? But for anyone who's been victimized and their offenders are unremorseful, it's been important for me not to forgive. Now, I say that I don't think Jewish people have quite such a big deal with the forgiveness thing. But to a maybe to a non Jewish audience in, a, in the 21st century where you're not allowed to hate anybody and every everything's acceptable. I want to tell you, no, not everything acceptable. There is black and there is white. There is good and there is evil. And we have to call evil by its name. But what I understood, I have, I maintain my rights not to forgive and I maintain my right to hate them, meaning to pursue justice and make sure they'll never get out. Uh, and by maintaining that right and not having some like snowflake come up to me and say, oh, you're going to hurt their feelings because you're not forgiving them. By maintaining my moral right to hold them accountable, what it did, it liberated me. It freed me to relate to completely innocent people, Palestinians and Muslims, with no uh, hidden agenda, no uh, bitterness. So I think I'd like to go back to that, you know, the Talmud. He who is kind to the cruel is going to be cruel to the kind. And so that definition, that, you know, every Friday we do Shabbat, right? We do, love deal. Shabbat is different from the rest of the days, okay? But I had to make that moral difference, difference between evil and good. Okay, I don't know if that's particularly clear. I suddenly heard my own voice talking much too much. So let me move on, all right? Um, so the last thing I want to say, uh, in Hebrew we have a saying, uh, like it's psychologia bekatsaya mazleg, meaning pop psychology. And I wouldn't want to demean my psych psychology so much, but I have got some tips. I've got, I think I've got some tips for everybody. What have I learned? Uh, and I'll say to people here, if they're students, I know that especially in America, there's amazing pressure for kids to go to the right college and to succeed. I mean, you're already thinking about a college education when you're four. Like the most important thing in your life is a college education. Read my lips. No, it's not. No, it is not. That is not the most important thing in your life. I don't know anybody who died and you go to their cemetery and you see on their tombstone, Rest in peace. This is the man who had a, a BA in mathematics, all right? Nobody writes about what you did. What, what we leave, our footprint in the world, is not firstly what we do, it's who we are. And it's who we are in what we do. So that's, that's a lesson. Not everybody's blessed with a college education. There's plenty of people leaving living meaningful lives, all right? I'm not saying college education isn't important, but it's much more important to be the person that we're supposed to be morally, ethically. It's more important to be kind than get a BA, trust me. Uh, another thing I learned, and it's hard, you know, when you're a bit younger to see life in such a, a vast perspective, but and it's a cliche, but I think I can allow myself a cliche because I'm not speaking cliches. I'm speaking from what I know, all right? We only have one life. And we are deluded into thinking that we're all going to go along and like die a nice uh, safe death under pink sheets at 95 years old. Don't want to put the fear of God into anybody. I don't know what's going to happen, but we, we must realize we are all on borrowed time okay so what does it mean to live life well yes it is that college education but it's more than that it's you know if you love somebody don't just say you love them it doesn't mean anything tell them why you love them so you know what you're the kindest person today you went and did this for me uh you're the funniest person i love your jokes you know just if you love someone but it's also what, how we love other people. And it, it's so easy to become so self-focused, right? So self-centered. But if, you, if you're in, in school and someone's on their own, go and talk to them. If you've had an argument with somebody, say you're sorry, if you really are sorry. You know, if it's just a small argument or do everything you can to make peace. Because we don't know what's going to happen. And it's the honorable thing to do. And the other thing is, 
and this is a cliche, but I, I can't think of another way of saying it. I've been gifted with the present, meaning I can't change the past. I can't come to terms with it. And I would never want to come to terms with the past. Um, but I kind of have to let it be what it was, all right? I can't predict the future. I can't live in the future. So the only, only moment, the only real meaningful time I have is right now. And that's why I was having a little chat with the, the participants before this uh, thing, saying how many are people attending and they gave me numbers. And I said, it's all good, you know, whether it's a few or whether it's many, because I don't live in that same time zone as I used to. I mean, in this, what we're doing now, look, I can see Austin's lovely face. I can't see any of you else, all right? But this is the best thing I've ever done in my whole life. And I mean that because this is life now. There is nothing else. This is it. And finally, finally, and then if you have questions, and by the way, I'm not sensitive. You can ask me anything. I'm not going to like burst into tears or, or whatever, really. And if you don't have questions, that's also fine. But the last thing I learned, you know, what is it to be Jewish? What does it mean to be Jewish? And of course, there's a hundred thousand answers to what it is to be Jewish. But for, for me, and I'm, I'm, I'm a Jew in progress, okay? But I looked at the etymology of the word Jew and it has, as far as I know, two, two meanings. Uh, and I find them both incredibly relevant to my situation. I think they're relevant to everybody. One, I'll say it in Hebrew. I, Jew, all right, the word Jew is connected with the word to, oh my gosh, how do you say it? Recognize. I recognize. I, uh, there's another word, but it escaped me. I recognize, I uh, acknowledge, admit, accept that I don't need, or there will be things that I don't understand. Just recognizing that I don't have to work everything out in life is quite the relief. That's one thing, that's one meaning of the word Jew. The root of the Jew is to recognize and accept. And by the way, it's also to recognize and accept our responsibility in life. And the second thing, to be Jewish, uh, every morning, you know, what's the first thing we say? And I got a tattoo of it, just so I don't forget. I don't forget. I got it like this. I give thanks to you, O living and eternal King, that in your compassion you restored my breath. Great is your faithfulness. And uh, to break that down, and I'll conclude with this sentence, that simply means... You know, I feel the richest person alive. I think I'm the richest person in the world. And it comes from, not luck, but it comes from gritting my teeth and learning to cultivate a grateful heart. And I think that's something we can all do. You know, there's so many, there's so much goodness in life. And if we can learn to see it just in the micro, then... Uh, I think we have a much, much higher quality of life. So I want to finish there. And if anyone has any questions, you're you're welcome. And I'm not sensitive, guys, really. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kay. Um, we were talking before when you previously before we started the event, and I had the honor of uh, meeting you in 2017 when I was on my Hasbro trip. And I'm not just saying this because you're here, but it was honestly one of the highlights of the trip is hearing your story and getting that tour through Jerusalem. Um, your perseverance and inspiration has touched so many people, um, even those who were not uh, able to be on the call today. I know so many people from you know, the US, UK, um, Israel, obviously, that know your story and have heard of you. And there's only so, much good, so many good things to say about you. And again, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. So I do have a couple questions here. And feel free, uh, whoever's on this call, or uh, event, should I say, in through Facebook Live to send any questions you have, whether in the Q&A or over Facebook Live. So I will start off um, with a couple of questions of my own. Um, so the first one being, um, 
with with living in Israel, uh, have you found a community of others who have lived through terrorist attacks? And if so, how have they helped you kind of survive and kind of overcome the trauma you've uh, faced? Wow, what an interesting question. And thank you for what you said, Austin. That's very meaningful, by the way. I appreciate that. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, there's a big terror club here in Israel, obviously, because uh, over the years, there's been a hundreds and hundreds of attacks on uh, civilians. So f at first it was like, I mean, what can you do? I, I got to be honest that the, the terrorists in the 90s, they were blowing up buses, right? And who rides on the bus? It's usually uh, like I have a car. I mean, I'm rich. I'm filthy rich because I have a car. I mean, we're so blessed here. But the people who don't have a car, you know, they're, they're the poorer people and they use public transport and usually the people who live in the city. Uh, so it, for, for the most, if you look at the demographics, um, a, a big percentage of people of, who've been, you know, in terror attacks are the religious community. And of course there's non-religious people too. Um, there's Arabs who've been in uh, terror attacks um, committed by Palestinian terrorists. There's Christians, obviously my friend was a Christian. So, but just to go back to that very interesting question, I met, you know, there's a wonderful organization called One Family, One Family Together. And look, it was really my first encounter with the Orthodox world. I mean, Orthodox, I don't mean like Jew light, I mean like Orthodox, all right. Um, and that was strange, that for me, because that was all, it wasn't just, it was unfamiliar being who I was now, having been stabbed, but suddenly my whole environment changed with these people. And I found it uh, absolutely marvelous. And, you know, we get together sometimes. And I can tell you, uh, the jokes, the jokes are just great. It's sick black humor, which is my favorite ever humor. The worse humor, the better. And we're all like it. And I think that's the only time we talk about terrorism um, because you get to a point where it just gets boring. It's just boring. And you know, when it gets boring to talk about it, you know, there's that's that light at the end of the tunnel and it's not the train coming the other way. So uh, yeah, my I think to answer uh, whoever asked it, the, my world was, it was shattered, but it was opened up. It was opened up. And um, there's definitely like a family, you know, it's like the Freemasons, you know, have that little secret handshake. So uh, sorry if anyone's a Freemason, no offense. No, I'm not sorry. I don't care if you're offended. I really don't care if you're offended. Deal with it. But basically, when you see another person who's been in a terror attack, there is this intuition. There is this like slight bonding of hearts that you don't have. You feel a bit more understood than you would in the big regular world. Perfect. Thank you so much. So I know through... Um seeing you in a couple other events and talking with you um, on many different occasions. Um, you don't consider yourself a victim of terrorism. You like to kind of distinguish yourself and not call yourself, oh, I was a terrorist victim. Um, could you kind of shed light more on why you kind of consider yourself not a victim? And like, how do you kind of, um, um, how do you kind of deal with that? Okay, well, we, we need a reality check too, Austin. And I sometimes miss this as you know, generally I miss the reality check in life, but, but I would never deny because it's true. I was a victim and I still am, you know, if we take, I mean, we have to look at time differently. I was a victim of a heinous terror attack, but I don't want, I don't want to be, de to be determined by that victimhood. Right? I don't want to deny it. Um, but I'm a musician, right? So I'm terribly sensitive to how words sound, not just by what they mean. I am a highly acclaimed published author too. You have to mention my book, The Rage Less Traveled, advert break ended. But so the, even the word victim, to me, it's very nasal, right? Victim. I mean, I just, it's just, it's horrible. It's like listening to somebody slurp their soup. So 
and I also felt just to just to call myself a victim is not um, it's not fair on the people who were murdered, you know. And am I just like victim light and they're victim heavy? I mean, and if you look, heaven forbid to compare, all right, but just in in the Holocaust history, the victims are the murdered, the survivors are the ones who survived. So uh, I wouldn't deny I'm a victim, but I also didn't want to get, give them, meaning those terrorists in jail, I didn't want to give them that satisfaction that, you know, I wish this was being live streamed in prison. You know, if they were, I'd just be grinning and like, you know, have a bottle of beer and like, yes, I'm carrying on living my life. That kind of thing, which is sometimes it's an emotional denial, but it's, I didn't want to be solely defined by what happened to me. And now 10 years later, I mean, I'm speaking less and less because just, that's just the way the cookie crumbles. It's by choice at the moment. Um, but I'm learning to do other things that are not connected with the funding of the Palestinians or speaking on behalf of terror victims. And I love it because you know what, Austin or whoever asked the question, I kind of missed me the last 10, I missed me, I missed me. And it's nice to feel a little bit me now. So did that answer the question? That was incredibly long winded. I, I apologize. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, you're one of the few people I get to talk to and actually like get a good answer out of when uh, conversing. So I'm very happy that you're able to go in depth with these. Um, we do have maybe one or two more questions before we do have to wrap it up. But um, the next question is uh, being involved in de-radicalization organizations such as the Yellow Brick Road, what impacts have you seen come about through these practices? And how vital are they to combat terrorism, whether in Israel or other parts of the world that experience uh, terrorism? Okay, so the Yellow Brick Road, this is the name of the club, you know, that I started, uh, basically on my favorite movie, The Wizard of Oz. Uh, so the results of the, it's not like spectacular. I mean, it's not like, you know, I, I, I'm just not an NGO person, you know, where you have to like, like put it out there on Broadway. It's very small, it's just like 10 kids come and now in the corona they can't come. Um, but the, the results of this, you, we're teaching them small things like you, you drop a cup, you pick it up. You've had a drink of orange juice, you wash your cup, you take out the trash. So by teaching the children just to care for their immediate environment, uh, how they're speaking to their friends, that kind of thing. All right, it's basic things in the West, in the West, in Israel, in America, it's things we take for granted that these children, uh, they are deprived, that, that a lot of them don't have that. So uh, on, on, a, on a huge level, you know, what are we seeing? We're seeing happier children, happier children. Children who like, you know, we bought them some seeds so they can water the plants and see life grow. Everything is about life. And it's like, wow, that's so cool for them. So it's like, I find it incredibly moving just to uh, do that kind of thing. And another thing is the contact with the parents, um, wonderful parents. Now, of course, I'm doing all this virtually because as an Israeli, I'm not, a, by Palestinian law too, I'm not supposed to be there. So uh, it's done by WhatsApp videos and all that kind of stuff. But there has been some very um, moving happenings, like one little kid, you know, in YouTube, you watch something and it recommends you the next video or something. I don't know how it works. So this little kid was listening to Islamic songs why not Arabic songs? It's his language. And then he had like, YouTube recommends you this. And it was like an ISIS song. And he came to the club singing an ISIS song. So we're very fortunate to have a wonderful young man working there as the teacher. And that meant he had to intervene with the parents. Now, of course, nobody in over there knows that Jews are involved with it. Okay, because otherwise it'd be very dangerous but we talked about it for him and 
he basically handled it very well. He said, look, the yellow brick road is not called that over there, by the way. It's called a different name, so there's no paper trail. But he said, look, this is a happy place where we talk about life and good things. We're not talking about death. We're not killing people. And uh, if you feel that your child can't adhere to that, then that's fine. He can come back another time when he feels more able to do that. And the kids stop singing these songs. So I think that's, I think that's an incredible, you know, that could, that could change a world. And the fact that we teach them English, you know, that just, and computer skills that I, I find that's enormous. I think that's just like, it's you, you change one little thing. That's all one kid. And it's like concentric circles. What was the second part of the question? Um, um, so it was basically just asking about, um, like, are these programs vital to combat terrorism? Yeah, or absolutely. Absolutely. But it's very small. And I'm, a, you know, I don't know how to fundraise and stuff. So we have what we have. Um, I don't know that we can ever combat as just ordinary civilians. I don't know if we can ever combat terrorism as a whole because uh, there's always going to be evil people in the world. Uh, we can certainly reduce it, and that would be by, re by stopping entirely, stopping the funding of the Palestinian Authority. And I have to say, I'm extremely disappointed in the current American administration. Let's say they were naive and good-hearted and they just want to help. It doesn't work like that. You cannot reward thuggery and not hold people accountable. So I think when people are held accountable and there's no money given to terrorist organizations, which is what the Palestinian Authority is, then we have hope for a better world. Absolutely, for sure. And I think everyone on this call echoes the same mentality that um, actions flutter the words so once, so it only begins once the ball starts getting rolling. Um, so again, I wanna thank you, Kay, so much for taking the time uh, this afternoon or evening. Um, join us for this intimate and really eye-opening and insightful conversation. As our time together comes to an end, I just want to again thank Kay Wilson for taking the time to speak with us today about her experience in her life and the work she does today. I would also like to thank everyone who is tuning in to this. Um, it really means a lot to me, Camera, Kay, and everyone ar around who uh, took the time out of their day to uh, view this. And also, I want to thank Camera on Campus for helping me uh, put together this event. Um, and so without further ado, um, we will close out this event today. So, Kay, do you have any closing remarks? Um, if not, I'll uh, end the call for uh, today. No, I just want to thank everybody for turning up. And uh, really, and thank you, Camera. Thank you very much. You do very admirable work. Perfect. Thank you all so much. And thank you, Kay, again.